Uh, welcome everybody to week seven of our Education's Digital Future Equity by Design seminar. Uh, this has been a wonderful quarter so far and it's hard to believe that we're already in week seven. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, our, s our seminar series is dedicated to discussi discussing issues at the intersection of technology, equity, and learning. Our goal in hosting this public seminar is to try to have a, a place for conversation that goes across the typical boundaries of educator, research, industry, foundation. Uh, there's not very many places that we get to have this kind of public conversation. Our hope is to continue this conversation over multiple years and to find ways to collaborate and, uh, and actually try to make a difference in what's happening in the space of education, technology, and equity. Uh, so we've been excited to see the continued interest in attending these Monday night sessions, even as the weather gets to be more, more beautiful and the students get more and more stressed with the end of the quarter coming. Uh, just to get a sense quickly of who's joining us tonight, how many have been to other sessions this quarter? Wow, look at that. A lot of repeat offenders. Um, <laughs> excellent. And how many people are new this evening? Great. So we have a few new people. Beautiful. Um, and just to track our progress and try to take, you know, break down some boundaries, how many classroom educators do we have in the room? Wonderful. Stanford students? Wonderful. Glad to see you here. Uh, university faculty or staff? <coughs> Great. School administrators or leaders? Wonderful. Industry professionals? Yay, we have a few, that is excellent. Nonprofit professionals? Good, like to see that. Um, how many parents in the room? Okay, <laughs> wonderful. So uh, everyone give yourself a round of applause for being here. So as I said, you know, our, our focus is this intersection between equity, learning, and technology. Uh, we are really excited that we've been able to draw local educators and we're, we, as we've been mapping who's coming, we are really stunned to see that people are coming as far south as Watsonville and Gilroy, um, up to San Francisco and somewhere up there, I think, it's Richmond. Excellent. So this has been great. Um, we're seeing elementary and secondary school teachers, school leaders, as well as technology coaches. Uh, this is exciting to us because we actually believe that we have to work locally and regionally if we want things to happen. Um, there are many national conversations going on, but we, we know that to make a difference, we have to build at the, the level of where young people are meeting educators. Uh, we encourage you to share, even though we're having a local conversation, using Twitter, if you like, uh, based on the conversation tonight. Uh, we're excited for this topic because it is a conversation that's been going on nationally for quite a while, and that is how do we help all young people not only become familiar with technology and, and use technology in classrooms to improve their academic achievement, but how do we help them learn to create, design, build, and critique the technologies that are around them all the time. And we're very fortunate this evening to have a number of visionaries in the room um, who have been working on not only making this happen in local context, but also thinking about how do we assess and measure. And um, tonight we have uh, a wonderful lightning speaker. So for those of you who have not been in the room before, uh, we start off our sessions when we can with a very quick five minute talk by someone who's been doing inspiring work on the ground. Uh, tonight we're very fortunate to have Corinne Okada Takara. Uh, so Corinne is a Bay Area artist and arts educator who creates technology integrated art projects. Her public collaborative work explores the use of modern day products to preserve cultural heritage and memory and honors the colliding and merging stories that arise in rapidly shifting communities. She does workshops for museums, for K through 12 classrooms, libraries, and she's uh, excited about trying to foster creative confidence. We are very thrilled to hear what she's been up to and I'm gonna turn it over to her now and please join me in welcoming Corinne.
Can you hear me? Okay. So I got five minutes. All right. Um, what did you make today? Ask this of students, and they may pause. This is a different question than what did you do today? How many students really see school as a place for expressing themselves, making, and creating? Well, more and more schools are looking to bring in maker space and technology environment to encourage making. But certain groups are underrepresented, including girls and students of color. So how do we create more equity? Right now, 50% uh, of the manufacturing, advanced manufacturing and engineering workforce is about to retire. And we don't have a pipeline of a lot of students going into STEM and not keeping up. And of those who are in STEM, uh, the demographics have not changed since 2001. So this is what we got. So how do we increase equity and bring more students into these environments? Well, let's reframe what um, some of these terms might mean. Um, let's talk about equity as who has keys to the room, uh, diversity is who is in the room, and inclusion as who feels welcome in the room. So this is what we want to look for when we're creating these technology spaces and these maker spaces. And we know that it's just not technology that we need. What the crucial ingredients are the questions and the journey that we embark upon, engaging, um, well, ongoing teacher training for certain, and engaging families and local communities. The journeys and questions need to be like jellyfish. They need to be sticky, transparent, flexible, and porous. So what do I mean by this? Um, the questions really need to be sticky. They need to anchor to the students' lives. So the students don't think technology just lives in their classroom or in their maker space. They need to connect with their world outside the classroom. And it needs to anchor into what they are experts in, which is themselves and their community. And as we go on these journeys, such as reimagining your bedroom or uh, your magic wand, we can anchor into the, the STEM techniques, STEM learnings that we want. We can tie into culture. We can explore um, what they're experts in in terms of their neighborhood and urban design. And then we can expand outwards. We need to expand outwards. Outwards. They need to know that they're part of a bigger conversation, um, and they can design schools for astronauts in zero gravity on the ISS, or they can imagine Mars habitat. So learning needs to be transparent. And what I mean by that is we have to celebrate process, because what they carry forward is not the product that they make, but the process journey. They take that knowledge and that technique towards the next project they move on. So if we document, if they document, they see that. A hurdle or a failure is not something to ignore or to celebrate, but something to pivot from, okay? Um, and our materials need to be transparent. I really believe in working with breadboards and very exposed wires and just really simple loads because expensive circuitry kits that live in a classroom do not go home with the students. And what they make and what they explore needs to go home and they need to, they need to iterate and live with it with their families at home. We need to be transparent that we all are learners and we all are teachers. Students can teach us many things, um, such as how to make music. Um, and we are learners as educators. And I really believe that teachers need to be supported uh, with the technology that comes into their spaces. Uh, equal amount of funding for the physical materials as training. We need to be flexible in the journey. Um, give them choice, and as well as time to tinker in what their STEM explorations are. Um, I teach a 3D print girls uh, club, and I follow what they want to explore. And in that process, we can learn deeper uh, CAD tools, techniques of blocking. We can learn split fit, snap fit design, assembly design. But following what they are interested in um, is a really great approach to really anchoring them and making them feel like this is their medium. We need to make the journey porous, and that is letting it seep into the home and community. Have make and take projects, things that go home. Have the students teach back in the communities at different events so they are the teachers and they're connecting with the community through technology. And then uh, lastly, workshops with moms and daughters. The Sunnyvale Library is doing make her workshops for mothers and daughters, and it's wonderful for them to have the conversations and journeys together around STEM. If we involve the whole ecosystem in students' lives, um, in informal learning spaces, libraries, and camps, it will really advantage students who are in underserved communities because there's teachers cycling in and out every year. A lot of times that's where kids do the teacher training. But the permanent people in their lives are going to be at the library, their summer camps, um, other informal, informal learning spaces. So we need a synergy there. And if we do this, their imagination will take flight. And they will know if we create environments where we are connecting with the stories of their lives and the reality of their lives, then we will create 
excited STEM learners and, and innovators who know that they have the keys to the room and once they're in there, that they belong. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. That was wonderful and a great uh, kickstart to the panel. So uh, I didn't say that I am Bridget Barron and, and I'm co-leading the, the initiative that's sponsoring this along with Janet Carlson, who's in the back, and um, Angela Stoya and Amber Levinson. And we're very fortunate tonight. We like to hand off the mic to other people mm -hmm. so that we really get the conversation to be broader than uh, the conversations that we normally have. And so tonight we are really fortunate to have Betsy Corcoran, who's keep, he's responsible for keeping the whole Ed Search operation running. <laughs> and um, this is wonderful. So she is going to moderate and introduce our panel. Uh, she was previously executive editor for technology coverage at Forbes Media. Earlier, she was an award-winning staff writer for the Washington Post and Scientific American. She's led professional development workshops on using IT in public elementary schools, and she is our perfect moderator for this evening. I'm going to turn it over to her. Welcome, Betsy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I loved the opening question about asking what kids made today. And it's particularly perfect because all three of our speakers today are truly makers. They're making spaces, they are making projects, they are making opportunities for kids. And so if you ask these people what they've made today, or at least maybe yesterday before they got on the plane to get here, um, they will have an awful lot to say. Uh, so uh, you guys know how this program works. We're going to give each of them about 18 minutes to kind of share some of their uh, some of their work. Um, we are going to create a little bit.ly here and uh, all it is is basically a blank slate. Um, if you guys have questions and you want to add those questions uh, either during their talks or as we start having the conversation then we can do hopefully a good job of bringing your questions into it. And I have made perhaps a rash promise which is that if we don't get to your questions we'll make an effort to to get those answered and, and share those answers out with you as well because I'm sure you'll have a lot to ask these amazing people. So the first one up is Nicole Pinkard and I don't think Nicole actually remembers when she and I met. And, uh, yes, at a conference. I know, we met before then, see? She didn't even realize. Uh, I met Mac uh, Nicole actually uh, at the MacArthur Foundation when she was really sort of in the early days of talking about the project U Media that she was leading at the Chicago Libraries and what an amazing program it became. Um, her background is uh, astonishing. A uh, bachelor's in science, in computer science from here at Stanford, an MS in computer science, a PhD from Northwestern, and she is, of course, an associate professor at the College of Computing and Digital Media at DePaul in Chicago. But really what I think of her is, is the force, the spirit, the inspiration behind an amazing project in Chicago that's inspiring libraries and uh, digital media work all across the country. So please join me in welcoming Nicole. I'll let you sit. Yeah, which Hello, hello, hello. I am always, and let me take it back to the beginning. So close your eyes, please. I promise I, I can get through all those slides. Okay. Um, I am so happy, always happy to be back at Stanford. And I will say, Corinne, your talk, we're going to, I think, I know you already have a twin, but I think after you hear this, you might think that we were twins. <laughs> Triplets. Um, so DYN for years has been trying to understand this issue of what does it mean to create an uh, infrastructure that supports equity um, in, in all ways, in all digital formats? Initially, we started off doing most of our work in the area of digital media, but as the tools for uh, creating with computation and 3D have become more easily available, able to go home, we've sort of turned our attention. Um, 
uh, to other work. So yes, we have been uh, some of the leaders in the work with Umedia, the Cities of Learning, but really in, in I had to ask myself about three, four, or five years ago, really a while ago, to say while we've been viewed as being successful, when I still look at my programs around coding, and, I, and I'm actually even one of the people teaching the classes, I still have the gender um, um, lack of equity in my classes. And when I would sit and talk to the sixth grade girls and the eighth grade girls and the boys, they were just like, we just have different interests. So how are you going to create a pod that's going to enable all of us to uh, coexist together? Um, so in thinking about um, the work that we've done, which has always been at this intersection of schools, home, out of school, really trying to say, can kids have access to media right at their fingertips, we decided um, four years ago to say, let's really try to tackle this, in this issue of diversity uh, around participation gap as it relates to technology. Um, and in talking to our kids, our girls, our parents, some of the key gaps that everyone um, hears are there was an experience gap, there was a lack of confidence, the negative stereotypes with, you know, definitely when you talk about middle school, it's like, is it okay? to geek out with technology, the climate, even in our own programs. You know, the girls were saying that the video game pod was a boys only space, so, you know, should we go there? The dearth of uh, role models, and in some sense, some of the lack of interest, um, the general interest. So we're like, well, what can we do to engage, um, engage girls? With the goal of trying to make learning or STEM learning a lifestyle for them, that's something that they're just doing. And the importance of this is when they're just doing it, you see them, girls, the data will show, will do the work at home and at school. They'll do the assignments, but when you look to see are they doing it at home, are they doing it in their free time, that's where you begin to see some differences. And so for me, the focus on it becoming a lifestyle and part of identity means it creeps from school, it creeps into home, and you're doing it in all sectors. So we don't view ourselves successful unless we begin to see data where girls are taking the project and beginning to um, couple them with other things that they're doing. So I'm going I'm to talk about um, this project called Digital Youth Divas, which really is saying, well, how do we merge design, um, computation, and making? And it's important to say those three, design, uh, coding, and making. And why I'm adding the design is because one of the things we realized early on, when we didn't focus on the design aesthetics of it, the girls would do the project once, I've done it, let me move on. When you start to talk about the design, the quality of it, or you're creating something you want to wear, then all of a sudden, I want to do 10 of them. I want to iterate on it. I really want to develop the skill set. So Digital Divas is a, a program to uh, focus on that. Is there a timekeeper here at all? Good, okay. Okay. Here's the, here's the team. And there's one imp another importance to say here is that none of our mentors are techies, computer scientists. So one of our rules were that we can't hire computer scientists to be the mentors because the reality of our likelihood of being able to place them in all the communities where we need mentors is not plausible. So we work with college students who are majors in all kinds of different things but not CS to become the mentors in these programs because we figure if they can be vulnerable with their challenges with learning this stuff, then they'll make it easier for the girls to engage. And pretty much it's really can we create a connected learning uh, community where, where it's equitable and girls are developing the skills and knowledge and dispositions to work tomorrow, but working on things that we hopefully hope they are passionate about. And our research questions are, we're looking at knowledge, or, or, or girls gaining any conceptual knowledge and understanding about the core concepts, perceptions, do they believe that they're developing some sense of expertise? Because oftentimes they're developing expertise, but they don't believe it. And second, are they connecting it to an interest in STEM? So are they seeing what they're doing as, um, as engaging in STEM, and do we see them taking on uh, willing, or do we see, the, see them wanting to take on projects or even join other programs that are pushing their STEM knowledge? And how we're looking at it is a combination of survey data and also a face to face and looking at their online, a lot of the log data and, and things like that. Um, and so the combination of the program is every Saturday we get girls and parents come to the program. They come to DePaul and they do all kinds of different activities, but they also then have to do things at home. So every girl has a tablet, um, an $80 tablet, where they can extend the activities at home. And we're really trying to see how they connect with each other and how they connect with mentors are gone away. 
And then here's the components, the Saturday program. We do field trips where we actually intentionally connect them to other places around the community that are doing similar things. So we'll take them to a, um, a maker. Uh, we'll take them like we've gone to Marwin, which is great for teaching design, and they do specialized programs for girls. We're taking them to a maker space where they're going to do a specialized program for the girls. So we try to make them comfortable in the spaces that we know that they have to begin to participate in if they're going to truly develop their interests. And then, of course, we have, it's important that you have uh, peers and you have 24-hour access to connect with people. The numbers, just um, when we put this call out for we only took 100 girls, they come from 65 different schools across the city, nine private schools, nine selective enrollment. Um, you know, the numbers are not the number of kids. These are the individual girls' ID numbers, so we don't have 55 kids from one place. But the reality is they come from 60, 65 different schools. You can't, and you only have about three girls from any one school. And these are STEM schools, so we could not get, um, you don't have a cr critical mass in any other schools of interest. Ethnicity, they're uh, represented across all over the city and also across different age range. The curriculum, and we do, a, is that Ms. Pauline, sorry. Uh, the curriculum, the first year curriculum combines three things, e-paper, e-fashion, and e-dance. And the distinction is e-paper and e-fashion is all about circuits but it's also teaching them to think about fabrication differently. One, you're fabricating with copper wire. The other one, you're, cop you're uh, fabricating with thread. And so they begin to understand that circuits make mean the same. It's the same thing, but you can represent it differently. And then we move to something which is e-dance, which is think blocky scratch, but teaching animated characters to dance. And in each of these activities, girls are learning something STEM-based, but they're applying it in ways that are meaningful or meaningful to them. But we wrap all of this in these narrative stories. So imagine, anybody remember the Babysitter Club? Okay. So these are the digital divas, middle school girls, and their teachers on the, on the side. Um, and they get into all kinds of issues and problems in school, and they have to s use STEM literacies to solve them. Um, and the girls then have to help them solve those literacies. So we unveil them with uh, narratives, either, um, either comic books or videos, where it, all of the characters in the story are trying to figure out how do I use my STEM knowledge. And then the girls in the real life digital divas are trying to solve the same thing. But they're also interacting with these animated characters through the social network. And so what you really, is interesting because you're like, well, are they going to buy this? But in some sense, they bought into the fact that, oh, they know that they're not real, but in some sense, they buy into the storyline of having to do the same activities that the girls are doing. What, and the social network, what it looks like is you get in and there's a project. Each one of these is a stage of a project you have to do. After you do it, you upload it, you get feedback. So it becomes a 24-hour social network. What does it look like in action? Here's a video that shows you, that gives you a demonstration of it. And I did not, hopefully, sound, is sound connected? I just realized that. And here's a quick video. And this is an example. This is a freshman um, graphic design major who's one of the mentors um, from the camp. She's from uh, Mississippi, and she's one of the mentors. Throughout the classes, we give them these stories and narratives about STEM activities and how the characters in the stories, they use the activities. Characters in the user activities. <laughs> we'll see if this, give it a second, and if not, we'll just go past it. I think I'm probably on my, is this on my internet or? No, this is not even my computer. Okay. Try one more time. If not, we'll just keep going. Use the activities. So Rashana is one of the main characters in our narrative. She's going to get help from her fellow digital youth divas. She got this mysterious color note, and she's trying to decode what it means. We're working on a color theory today, and that's what they're also doing in the story. We got to decode it for her, and she got to talk to her on the website. So within the story, they say, hey, Rashana did this. Well, if Rashana can take what she learned at her digital youth camp and put it within her work outside of camp. Maybe we can do the same thing. I'm going to try to like make a card for our special days for people and use color and then explain it to them. This week we helped out Roshana by making more lights and colors in her design. Roshana's 
circuitry design has been stolen and the divas have to help her out. So for them to mirror the story, they have to learn circuitry first. I'm doing a parallel circuit. I'm making a um, series circuit. We show them the different components to make a working circuit. If you under... Well, what she would say, I believe, is if you understand it. <laughs> but um, let me keep going because I don't want to uh, um, use up time on this. But what you will see... Understand it. It's pretty easy. It's really cool because they're having a blast. I like the light up. So you hear all that beeping? Yep. This one has energy. So they're using multimeters? I'm trying to detect energy from objects in the room. Yep, they know what makes their LEDs light up, so they get it. So today we're going to end with a good grasp on our circuitry. Next week we're going to incorporate that into our design. The girls are designing their own mood flowers matching the design that Rashani used. Okay, let's just stop it from here. But so, in essence, what it shows you is they go through a full, a full, um, exit here. Hang on. Later on, we're going to add mm -hmm. LEDs to them. They are making their own circuit and inserting an LED light into What's the, the play. Okay, let's try this. Okay, let's go back to share. <clears throat> and so what you'll see is we'll go through a series of steps, step by step. So initially, like, oh, they're doing a color wheel. Are they really painting like that? Isn't that is that really STEM? But it 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 it, it goes deeper than that. And then they because they then begin to create these cards and these bracelets where color matters, right? They have to design for a particular person for a particular reason, and it's all integrated together. And so what you see in the system is they get feedback and things like that. You get online engagement with the mentors and also with the characters connecting to them, um, multiple ways in which they get feedback. The outcomes, what we've seen is we've increased the technical knowledge, so they know, they know, they know circuits. So the first question is, do they know circuits? Do they understand electricity? So we've increased their understanding of circuitry and knowledge. We've uh, understood, we've increased their ability to create drawn circuits when we give them uh, challenges. They can explain it. They can explain the technical language. They also are developing confidence. So if you ask them, when we did a, ho a when we did an assessment to understand is there, is there confidence yeah. developing, only in computer science and circuitry did we see a significant increase, which uh, speaks a lot for us. But then for me, from a qualitative standpoint, what we're beginning to see, and Bridge, this builds on top of Bridget's work with uh, these technobiographies, we're beginning to see the work go into the schools, but also transfer into the homes. So this is just one technobiography where a girl is talking about how she's using the work. If you listen to her words, she says, I show my work online to my friends or my art teachers so she could know, because she's very interested in what we're doing, because she was like, what do you do? Then I just show her pictures. It makes me feel good because it makes me feel that I can show her the things that I do. I don't have to be scared or anything, nervous. And we do art projects because she knows I can do certain things besides this on the website. So she says, okay, you did something like this before. And also, one of the challenges I think for us is the language, arts versus STEM versus, you know, are they seeing this as science? Are they seeing this as art? How do we uh, further uh, connect the language? I'm not gonna read this one, but it's another young lady talking about the value. But I'd say this, the single most significant piece of the work, or the challenge for us, this is actually perfect, has been the role of the parents. Um, for years we've done this work, but normally it's been a school setting, so it's a school where the kid gets dropped off and picked up at six o'clock. But we intentionally did the program on a Saturdays because we know that the data says if parents aren't in involved with their daughters in STEM, then the likelihood that it'll continue is limited. So we require the parents to come to the workshops. And we also require them, as you said, I can tell we're, we're related, um, to do the actual activities. And one of the interesting things that's come out of the work are the parents, particularly the fathers, saying, I now am developing a way to engage my daughter. Because it's been uncomfortable and how do I talk about STEM with my daughter the way I talk about sports with my son. So it's provided them a space to, uh, to do it. It's also provided the parents a space to, the mothers a space to feel accomplished. And so I think I have a video of this. And this comes out of the work we did with Bridget when we looked at um, families in Chicago and families in California here in Silicon Valley when kids said, who helps me do the work? And in Chicago, it was the after school and in, in, in Silicon Valley, it was the parents. And so our goal is if we can increase the, uh, the parent support and being brokers for their kids, in addition to keeping the supports and the programming, then we think that we can actually uh, go a long way towards closing these gaps. And I believe 
we have a video. This one hopefully will demonstrate what this looks like. So one of the outcomes of a workshop we just had um, is that four of the moms, after doing the e-cards, came up and said, you know what, we think we're ready to lead Diva's programs in our school. So we would like to spend the summer learning to be Diva's mom so we can take this program back into the, back into the school. And I want to end with this video that um, where after the kids do the work, after the parents did the work, they went into the classroom to show their daughters, and the daughters were showing show and tell both ways. And this is an interesting little clip of where you see the mom is satisfied and the daughter is satisfied. And what happened after this case is the, they bought out our materials in terms of to take the projects home and to be able to do them. So this is still at the beginning of the... Um, Today, the Divas are actually creating their e -cuff. Last week, we designed, and this week, we're adding our conductive parts. The e -cuff project is the prime example of what it takes to be a digital youth diva because it incorporates STEM activities with design principles. The e -cuffs incorporate everything we've learned from the beginning, so that's color theory, what we learned about polarity, conductive materials, and also the design things that we've learned. The girls are all in with the sewing. They're doing different patterns, different designs. They're taking it much further than we have taught them. Right now, while the girls are working, the parents are actually in the workshop, and they're working on e-cards. So that's what conductive materials and all the things that the girls have learned. The reason we do parent workshops is to kind of create a collaborative and uh, community around this, this whole experience for digital youth divas. But I also think it gives them a, something that they can do with their kids together. Um, then now they know something that their girls have done, so they can they can like, do a, an activity at home together. After the workshop, when they come in for the showcase, they're going to see these nice e-cuffs that the girls have designed, and they're going to see what it actually takes to be a digital e -cuff. How did you make your e-card? Um, I made my e-card with a lot of teamwork at my table. It looks great. Thank you. I used a lot of different materials like fabric and flowers and metal and copper wire. It was really a long process for this, but I feel really good about it. It so. looks very beautiful. Thank you. Good job. And so, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll end. So we, that's just one project, right? That one project is not going to make a girl comfortable in, in developing and becoming a STEM. But we believe those type of experiences create the environment where the girl returns, she continues, the parent and the daughters have something to engage. And so the, the web, if you will, the ecosystem of being engaged in STEM are, is opened up to possibilities. So I look forward to having a conversation about this. project. Uh, next up we have Rafrans Davis. Uh, I have to tell you um, at EdSurge we have lots and lots of people um, write and many are teachers, some are uh, um, executives, some are uh, administrators, um, but I would, um, I really have to tell you that Rafrans is actually one of our favorite writers. She does a great job. She speaks with so much authority. She is executive director of professional and digital learning for the Lufkin Independent School District and is really supporting the growth of digital leaders, teachers, and students through personalized learning, creativity, collaboration. Her tech specs are awesome. She is a Google certified innovator, a Microsoft certified indicator, and probably 35 other certified indicators, more than I could ever imagine. And is a, a huge, huge part of this community. Please welcome LaFrance Davis. Clearly, my mic is on. <laughs> Flower clicker. So I'm just going to stand here and hopefully not to interfere with that. Hello. Um, of course, my name is Rafrans, and I'm extremely honored to be here um, from Texas, uh, where I'm located, where I'm actually um, housed is in East Texas. And we are about 90 miles northeast of Houston, which just flooded last week. So we're always hoping that that doesn't quite go our way. But we really are, we really are proud of, of some, a lot of our students actually went down to help um, those that were affected by the flood. And those are the type of students that we are raising within our community. But that's not why I'm here today. I'm here to talk about how we spread uh, making and creating throughout Lufkin, which we have multiple inequities from the fact that we are a, about close to 80% of our students come from a low socioeconomic background. Um, we are about 30-30-30 in our um, 
um, main uh, um, racial diversities. And we um, are typically in our schools, this idea of baking and creating was not happening in every single classroom. This was something that was only happening within our gifted programs. And I've been in Luskin as of a year today, actually. And I'm happy to share that we have done quite a bit of work to change that, but um, you'll see a bit of our journey along the way. This is our superintendent. Her name is Dr. LaTanya Goffney. She started the school year off with a training um, that not only was about um, cultural responsive leadership, but was also about how we could change who, who we were reaching within our classrooms. Um, we have a STEM program that starts as early as fifth grade, but that STEM program was largely rich and white. And, um, and we looked at that and said, you know, that doesn't really represent who Luskin is. Yes, we want to reach those kids, but we want to reach all kids. And how, what can we do to make that difference? But my journey into Luskin started a lot like this. Yes, that is a lab that was in our school district. It, there's actually another um, picture that got, I removed. It was all the floppy disks that I removed from earlier this year. I kid you not, that's, that's the truth. Um, but the biggest barrier to growth in Luskin was this. So we've always done it this way. We have this program for these kids because this is the only way we've done it. We haven't done any work to reach and to change who gets to have these opportunities because we've always done it a certain way. Um, and we had to change that. Step one was we had to connect our teachers. I'm here today because someone probably found me on Twitter um, or through a blog. But the bigger piece of that is I'm here today because I understand the power of what information brings, that information brings access. And if you don't know, what can you do? And if you definitely don't know, how can you change it? Um, so that was like, the biggest piece of, of probably learning and, and changing the dynamics from within Luskin. We did want our students, to, our teachers and students, of course, to earn their global passports, get on Twitter, get on blogs, get in places to learn what other people were doing, and let's think about how we change the way students learn and what opportunities that we provide. That was exceptionally important. And I'm glad to know that that happened. We have three hashtags, Luskin U, which was created by our students, Lufkin Learns, actually maybe four, Lufkin Codes, Lufkin STEM. Somewhere all of those pieces will come in at some point in time, but the biggest thing that we wanted to do was to make sure we shared information amongst each other because that wasn't happening either. How were we reaching certain kids in one class but not certain kids in another? How did we open up opportunities in one school but another school was left behind? And that's what happens when you leave those decisions to be made at a campus level is it becomes that the people on the campus that believe in it will do it and those that not only don't believe in it or have no idea have no way of doing it but it's important to recognize when that happens and we were able to do that. Of course, we had to shift our lens and really take a microscopic look at um, how we viewed learning and who we were doing it for. That was a big piece. Were we doing it for the teachers? Were we doing it for the administrators? Was it for testing? Or was it truly for the kids? And that's where ventures like um, Hour of Code came in, and uh, I'll get to that in just a second. But the first part of that is we had to look at um, the tools that we had in our hands. And yes, this specifically talks about old technology, but we also had to look at the tools that were not necessarily technology and how we were utilizing those pieces. Um, we also had to think about what joy meant in the classroom, how much we wanted our students to enjoy it. I had a class, um, it happened to be banned, which um, is honestly music is a part of making and creating. Nobody could keep me from going to band. If band was 7.15 in the morning, I was up at 6 a.m. on great days. Um, and running to school, first one in, because I wanted to be there to get my instrument ready. That's what we want our students to do in school. And you know, that doesn't quite happen enough. And creating opportunities where kids are having hands-on experiences is such a deep part of that. But it's also something that not all of our kids get. My children didn't, that is for sure. And that honestly is probably what fuels my fire to change in my school district in any way, shape, or form. So of course, December came. But before December came and we had one week to code in one hour, um, <laughs> that's a whole other conversation, but we'll get to that. Um, before December came, we had a lot of prep work that needed to happen. I was one of those naysayers that said, oh my gosh, it's just a hashtag. Why are we doing that? It's a hashtag, blah, blah, blah. But something happened with that hashtag. We started coding and we coded on every campus and we invited the news in and we invited parents in and we had 65 year old grandmas calling our school to say, hey, I heard this coding thing was for everybody and can I learn? And that to me was a ticket. 
It wasn't something we were going to let go after one week. It was something that we were going to try to continue for, for throughout the rest of the school year. Um, but then a bigger thing happened. Um, <laughs> we had our first coding PD, and a teacher actually made this meme during training and tweeted it, which I thought was amazing, um, <laughs> because that's exactly what our teachers felt. But that also gave me a message that, it, yes, we wanted, I had, we have all these bright ideas of what we wanted to do with our students, but if we didn't make sure that we didn't have come and go drive through PD, but we had something that was supporting and sustainable, it didn't matter. And that was exactly, um, that was, that was exactly uh, kind of what happened. We did the whole sign up through code.org, who sends in a teacher to train our teachers for free, yay. Um, but you know what? Even though they came in for six hours, if they left that PD, which is exactly what it was, and they didn't know how to apply it in their classrooms or what to do beyond that, then why did we do it to begin with? Um, so we always had to come back to our why. Why do we do it? How do we do it? And how are we going to support it? And oh, by the way, why do we want to support it? Because those are really important questions to answer too. And we did that. And, and this, of course, is the main reason why, for our students. Um, we want our students to have these opportunities. And oh, by the way, they are also huddled around computers because remember in my district, a place with limited equity, we're working in within a school district where we had one lab per building, um, maybe five or six classroom computers, and we're trying to figure out a way to do this um, with our students. But at the same time, I happen to be at a place um, during our call to be inspired by our CTO, Megan Smith. I don't know if you've ever heard her talk, but I was there for the launch of, uh, of the CS Ed Week. And I'm thinking, we're coming in to talk about just coding and how to get schools to code. And she walked in with a drone, a Pikachu, a Lego robotics set. I think that is Pikachu up there. A Lego robotics set and a Raspberry Pi. And she said, I don't want you to just think about coding. I want you to think about going beyond that. And that moment, that week during CSA week is what changed our school district. Because as much as um, I'm, I'm hearing and, and, and probably I guess the lens from which I see that we need to think about innovation, my lens was only limited to what I saw even on Twitter from my community. And on Twitter it was hour of code, hour of code, hour of code, everybody codes. But the reality was what was we had to really think about what coding meant. It can't be just a game that they do in drag and drop format. What could they do with it? What could they make? And why would they even want to? Um, and then we, of course, got to come and talk about maker spaces. Uh, but so here's the deal with my school district. Uh, we, in our science curriculum, we have a section of engineering and actually engineering standards, because we're in Texas, we're not Common Core, and we're a little different. Engineering standards written within our science um, standards. But those engineering standards weren't tested. So guess what teachers did? They skipped them. Um, so we had to come back and look at what we were skipping and why, and what was our purpose. Um, because the purpose mattered and why we skipped it, and this image will mean something much later. Um, but the bigger piece was, is when we skipped them, we also skipped opportunities. Um, so we stopped skipping them. Our first graders that didn't use to get to make those toilet paper back scratchers got to come back and use design thinking to make those toilet paper back scratchers. And it was interesting to watch them do it, but it was even more amazing to get to test them. Because um, I got to scratch my back with toilet paper rolls and straw for a good three hours, and it was the greatest. But it was even greater watching them iterate and reiterate and go back and rethink that and come back and do it again. Notice, they didn't need to have the one lab in the school or the four computers in their classroom. They got to use materials that are around them at all times, so which also made us rethink, no, we're, we're not going to not say we don't need technology because we do. But we also had to realize that the tools didn't necessarily have to be plugged in. And they can be anywhere and everywhere. And as someone who is the aunt of a self-taught puppet maker, if anyone should have known that, I should have. Um, we also had to think about what else we have. Well, we had Minecraft. I am a Minecrafter for life. If you want to play, I will give you my Minecraft username, and I will invite you into my realm as long as you don't destroy it. Um, but what I like to think of Minecraft is also kind of the, if you had to have a space, it can be the maker space in your pocket. It's with you at all times. I sat in robotics and watched our freshmen and sophomores playing Minecraft in between learning how to code in C++. 
And I'm just sitting there looking like, all right, you're sitting there playing Minecraft. And, and I, it was not even a fuss. My mind went, we just have to really blow this Minecraft thing up. And so we did. Um, we created Minecraft clubs. This one meets Monday mornings at 7.30 a.m. Um, and let me just tell you, you know how I ran to school to come to band? These kids run to school because they're going to play Minecraft. But did, we didn't just want to play Minecraft. We wanted to extend it into our classrooms. So we created a space for teachers to learn, but from kids. And that was simple. I literally walked into a fifth grade class. And those are not just fifth graders. Those are actually ranging from um, pre-K all the way up to eighth grade. And I said, how many of you play Minecraft? And um, don't do that. That's their day because my ears might, might or may not still hurt from the screams of them actually just being excited about it. Um, but the bigger part was that when I said, how many of you would love to teach your teachers? And the screams were equally as loud. They wanted to teach their teachers. Our kids want to show us what they do. They want to show us what they do, even though we don't know that they do it. And so we had to create that space for them to do that. And that was the only way that Minecraft could become an opportunity. This was an image emailed to me from an eighth grade teacher after that training. She said, you know, I did not do the lesson in Minecraft, but here's what I did. She said, I changed the products that the kids could do, and I added Minecraft as a possibility. And the kids um, that were actually doing a project on, um, it, was, it was something global learning, I don't, it was, it's a dual language class, and I have no idea what they were learning, but they had to make something. They had to make a poster, a song, a diorama. This kid chose to make his, I think he visited a country and made one of the coliseums. He made his in Minecraft. That was her first time doing it, and that teacher didn't have to know how to do it. She just had to make it an opportunity for the kids, and so it is a part of what we do, and will continue to be a part of what we do moving forward. But then we have to think bigger than that and just wait on this one. So I kind of took the bait and bought the $3,000 kit of Little Bits. Um, and I was so excited because that was a thing back then. And everybody needed Little Bits. Um, and then I learned quickly, oh, by the way, yes, Team Green Matters, and that's my kid who happens to, happens to, happens to have his own kit. But not everybody had their own kit. And not every kid, um, not every kid wanted to make something and then take it apart because uh, little bits are expensive. They couldn't take them home, and that was a big issue. So yes, the little bits are great to teach just the base level about um, connecting and circuitry, but when kids want to continue their learning, having them build something and spend so much time on building it and then take it apart is counterintuitive to what we want them to do. So we just, you know, 20 bucks, um, some um, copper tape, LEDs and batteries, and then all of a sudden, we had kids making, you know, whatever they wanted. This happened to be Mother's Day. They made light-up cards. But yes, there's a whole story on what's creating because they all look the same. We'll deal with that later. The big piece was <laughs> that they actually do it, and the teachers uh, did. The teachers were the ones who, who initiated that, and it was amazing to see that happening in our school. I'm almost done. Don't worry. Um, and then, of course, we got um, Makey Makey, which when I bought it um, earlier in the year, um, the first thing everybody did was go play pianos and bananas, which was great. But what if our kids could use Scratch and Makey Makey to build an operation game? And it could really and truly integrate science, technology, engineering, art, and math in an authentic way. Um, and it, our teacher, who actually got her own uh, Makey Makey back in December and didn't actually try it until last week, um, <laughs> the best thing happened was when I walked into that classroom and she said, I wish I would have done this a long time ago. She says, I'm sorry. I hate that I waited. Next year I won't wait. Next year I'll have more. And I'm like, you know, we have like two of these in this district, but I can guarantee you with every bone in my body, I will order enough for us to start from the beginning. Because that's all we needed was the start. And the start truly matters. That's more of the Makey Makey. I had video actually on this, but I didn't think I had time for video. But we'll all share it if you want to see it later. But anyway, the first thing you have to do, of course, in a school district if you want to do this is you have to say yes to it. You need to say yes from a district standpoint, from a teaching standpoint, from a school leader standpoint. You need to be open to the fact that our kids learn differently than we did. And if the only thing you're doing is on a worksheet, then that's not the right thing to do. Um, we have to think about how they can use their hands, how they can use their eyes, how they can use their ears and how they can use their heart in their learning and that's what matters more than anything. You also have to create the space for play. Cardboard goes a long way and it's awesome. Um, yes, um, Kane's Arcade is a great start to that, but what can they build beyond an arcade and how can you truly involve them in that process? 
You also have to empower risk-taking. I did not tell a single person in my district and went to learn about Raspberry Pi for two days um, a couple of months ago, actually, around this area. Um, but the bigger part of that was the ideas that we get to bring back. So this summer, we're having our very first Camp Innovate in Lufkin, and it's two weeks. We're going to reach grades 3 through 12, about 150 to 200 kids. And every kid that comes to this camp is actually going to leave with their own Raspberry Pi for free. And that is because the other part of that is forming partnerships where you can. If you are in an area and you have kids in need, you need to tell your story and sing it loud. Because you never know who's going to hear. For us, it happened to be Microsoft. And I think I can say that now, that they're supporting our camp and providing every kid with a base level kit. But our high school kids who are going to hack the classroom, they truly are on their own network, not connected to the Internet. Um, they're going to actually design um, the space that they want to learn from and how they can use technologies to change that. And doing those types of things are important. And oh, by the way, I don't know how to do it, but our kids will figure it out. And that's what's awesome about it. Um, because what I want to do, and this is the last slide, of course, when I go back to school and I see the faces of these bright and shining kids, I want to be able to tell them that you truly can change the way you learn. You can change where you live, and you can be innovators because you are. But it's up to us to provide the resources and the space for them to do it. Thank you. How to clone refrains. <laughs> I think that that would be an amazing start. Um, Paula Blickstein is uh, very, very well known here at Stanford. He's an assistant professor at the Graduate School of Education and in the Computer Science Department and directs the Transformative Learning Technologies Lab. And his research, of course, focuses on how new technologies are transforming learning, science, engineering, mathematics. And he is one of the leading makerspace people here in the area. When we first started seeing schools in the Bay Area uh, begin to put in their own maker labs, Paula was the first person that many of them called to get a start. So, Paula. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, um, well, good, good evening and thanks a lot for inviting me, uh, the TELOS team, and thanks for the wonderful talk to the previous speakers. Um, so I want to talk today about our, our uh, main theme, and before I just want to acknowledge my, my students and postdocs, you see they're all very happy and always smiling all the time. Graduate school is a great environment. Uh, there are some of my collaborators that collaborate in some of the work I'm going to show here today. And um, so before going to like the main topic of uh, you know, the talk, I just want to quickly talk a little bit about what um, we do here, my lab, and, and, and thus uh, in this field of making. Um, so in 2009, when I came here to Stanford, I started a project called Fab Lab at School, which now we are renaming to Fab Learn. But uh, the idea was to put fab labs that, you know, at that time there were no makers, the name, the name makerspace didn't exist, but the idea was to put fab labs or makerspaces in schools, in K-12 schools, and develop teachers to use them, uh, develop assessments, do research, and, and all of that. And we did uh, one of the first, or maybe the first in, in the U.S. at the Castileja School here in, in Palo Alto, and then we spread to many, many different countries through academic partners in all of those countries, and now uh, uh, either directly or throughout, through our partners, we have about 30 schools we work with in all of those different places. 
in 2011, uh, we started a conference called FabLearn, which brought together researchers and, and teachers, practitioners, uh, nonprofits uh, who were working uh, in, this, in this field. And then it also spread to Europe. There is a FabLearn Europe every two years, in Australia every year, in Asia every year. And, and in Latin America starting uh, this year. And we also started a program called FabLearn Fellows, and we were super lucky to select like 15 amazing uh, teachers and maker teachers and maker practitioners. Uh, one of them is right there, uh, Krista. Uh, and we had you know, the pleasure to work with this group for two years, and uh, we produced a lot of web materials that you can find on this website. And especially uh, a book that is coming out next week, uh, the print version. The online version is already uh, available. You can download it for free. But if you want the actual physical version, it's going to be on Amazon in about uh, a week. Uh, so this is the Meaningful Making book that is, was entirely written by uh, K-12 teachers working in this, uh, in, in this area. And the other thing that I do here, which I'm not going to talk much about, is the research part, because that's a whole like, different uh, talk. But just to give you an idea, we develop here something we call multimodal learning analytics, which are methods to look at kids actually making things and extract information that we can use for assessment. So you saw here in this video the girls like trying to build a gearbox so here we're extracting like information from their facial expressions automatically using uh, facial expression uh, algorithms. And here we are extracting gesture data. So how they are uh, building those things and are they becoming more, uh, so, so we can ask questions like, are they becoming more systematic? Or are they uh, pausing to reflect on what they do and, and all kinds of things like that. So we develop a lot of those methods and you know, if you're interested in, in any of that, uh, we, I can send you papers and stuff, just uh, send me a, a, an email. But, uh, you know, what I would really want to talk about today uh, is about, you know, the issue of equity. And, and I think, uh, you know, equity is uh, a battle that we, we won in education. We won, like, as an idea, not in, real, in, 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 a, in, in reality, because it's very far from becoming reality. But as an idea, I think we won the battle. And just if you go 100 years ago, uh, look at, for example, you know, Google what like Kerberly, which names our school of education, the kinds of things that people used to say about education. You know, was, you know, it was not really about equity. It was about we have a workers' um, class, and they need to stay like that, otherwise society will fall apart. We have you know, an, an elite that needs to a different kind of education, and this is how the world works. And, you know, we've come a long way since then. And, uh, you know, because we live in, in this time where talking about equity is like, it's almost a truism, we sometimes we don't appreciate how hard it was to get to this place where we all agree, I mean, not all, you know, of course, maybe like one of the presidential candidates will not agree. <laughs> but uh, so, you know, never underestimate the amount, the, the craziness that can come uh, unexpectedly, but uh, we came a long way to, you know, consider this an, an important thing. But I think the, the second battle that I think is, is important to, to fight is convincing people that equity is different than sameness. So what I mean by that is that we uh, also maybe grew accustomed to uh, or used to this idea that if we give the ki kids exactly the same, Th we're giving also them uh, this, the same opportunities. So we're giving, uh, uh, we're giving them opportunities to, you know, for, for equity. So if we give them the same curricula, the same activities, the same everything, that, you know, that's equity. But I think what, we, what this idea of equity and sameness, uh, what this ignores is that uh, different social groups, they respond differently to whatever you give them because they have different incentives. They come from different places. So for example, a middle class student uh, in a K-12 school might, you know, they have uh, uh, an incentive to stay in school because they want to go to college. They know they'll go to college. They have parents telling them, oh, I went to college. College is really cool. You know, just, uh, it, you know, school is boring, but when, once you get to college, it's going to be great and all of that. And and, you know, so I know math is, 
is boring, everything is boring, but you know, kind of persists and it's going to be fine in a few years. But a, a, a kid from East Palo Alto, for example, with immigrant parents that don't have a college degree, I mean, they don't really know what, what, what's in the future. They don't know how college looks like. So the only, or one of the only incentives they have to stay in school is if school is interesting, if it speaks to their lives, if, if it speaks to what they care about. So if we give, you know, sameness in this case, it contributes to, to inequity because we're giving the same to people who are responding differently to what we give them. So we need to uh, uh, think about those things. So, you know, that's why I, I've been saying that I think this, w we've been, uh, uh, you know, we hear a lot that, oh, you know, public schools and in this kind of uh, impoverished areas and all of that, we have to give kids the basics, like, you know, the math and the, the language and all of that. And all this other stuff, this maker stuff and arts and all of that, that's, you know, uh, nice to have. So, you know, if you can do it, if you have money, you can do it. But uh, basically the idea is like, you know, for the poor kids, we give the basics. For the other ones, we give the cool stuff. And I think that's exactly the wrong way to think about this because uh, we're giving, you know, the, the basics where we, we should be giving the most interesting things because that's what, what's going to make them fall in love with learning, fall in love with school, uh, develop all the, you know, um, um, dispositions that will lead to lifelong, uh, a life of lifelong learning and, and all of that. So I think this idea that, you know, maker stuff and all of that, that's a nice to have, it, but, you know, it, we should really give kids the basics and if we have time, we do all this other stuff. I think we should think exactly in the other way. So, you know, schools with art, with sports, with making, with coding and all of that, those should be our public schools, not our, uh, you know, the schools of, you know, Palo Alto, uh, even though, I work with many of them and they're all wonderful, but you know, those kids will be fine anyways. So uh, now I want to go back a little bit in time and, and tell you how I got started in this whole thing and, and connect it to, to the project. So I started with making and, and making with kids in uh, this place in Brazil in a, a, a slum in Sao Paulo called Heliopolis in 2001 when I was a, a master's student. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, I don't know if you can see well because of the lights, but this is a very impoverished area, of course. And in this place was, you know, the first time I learned with the kids to do things like this. Use a broken tape recorder. So for those of you to know, we used to listen to music <laughs> using those things. There was a tape and... Um, so we, you know, disassembled those things and I learned with them how to, you know, cr instead of using the Lego motor, using the, the tape recorder motor, adapting it to, to you know, to use the, the other Lego parts. Uh, I learned a lot from the teacher, from the students, how to build stuff using all these found materials, how to improvise, uh, how to use, you know, uh, broken electronics and all of that. So this is a trash recycling machine, for example. Uh, that this uh, teacher built of his students. I will show you a little more detail in a bit, but another thing I want to point out, we developed uh, a board that was a low-cost robotics board that would, that would cost like $20 called Gogo board to work with these kinds of materials because the Lego uh, robotics was, you know, didn't really uh, work well with all the found materials. So this is how, you know, they would build all those things, the, the this trash recycling machine ha was like compacting the trash. So they used matchboxes and this kind of tape recorder uh, parts and all of that. They built devices to help, uh, you know, alleviate problems in the community. So this is a bus that they built with like a sound system and, and air conditioning and all of that and a system to detect w how many seats were occupied and all of that, all with, you know, um, found materials and all of that. And, and this experience, if you're interested in describing this paper called Travels in Troy with Trevor, that you can Google and, and find online. So, um, you know, this was in 2001, 2002, and since then I've been, I've been working, uh, doing all the, those kinds of workshops over and over. But back then this was like, you know, when I used to talk to teachers or policy makers or even researchers, they would say, oh yeah, this is nice, but it's, this is crazy. This is impossible. This is not like, uh, you know, feasible in schools. We don't have the technology. We don't have uh, 
uh, people don't really care that much about, you know, I mean, there was no word, there was no make, make magazine, and there was, we didn't have the vocabulary to talk about that. So what happened in the last 15 years? So how come this is now in every, every or not in every school, but in so many schools? So one of the things that happened out of uh, five that I'm going to talk about is that the agenda, the agenda of progressive education, you know, part of it became uh, kind of translated into something called 21st century skills that, you know, economists and policymakers and all of that kind of concocted this uh, expression of 21st century skills. And then, you know, things like problem solving, critical thinking, all of that, all of a sudden they became uh, okay, you know, and they were not like crazy stuff anymore because they were not coming from educators. They were coming from like the, the, the serious people in policy making and all of that and the companies and, you know, the tech uh, CEOs and all of that. So this is one of the things. There was a much greater social acceptance of the, the constructivist or the progressive education agenda or, you know, whatever, however you want to call it. And, and so, you know, I think that's, that's a, a, a great thing. A lot of the, those kinds of skills before this uh, expression existed were also like, you know, taken as like craziness of, you know, crazy educators. Like, um, second thing that happened was a uh, hundred or ten t tenfold reduction in cost. So 3D printers went from a hundred thousand dollars to a thousand dollars. Robotic kits went from five thousand super complicated kits to the Lego kits for $300 an hour, like Arduinos or uh, Google boards or Makey Makers and all of that for, you know, about the same price as a textbook. Private schools also looking for differentiation. So private schools competing and trying to find what's the new cool thing that I can do. And the maker thing was one of them. A dramatic growth in the mind share of coding and, and, and making with like the Make Magazine and the Maker Fair and code.org and all of those things. I mean, you know, like you or not those kinds of initiatives, but they definitely brought those things to the mainstream. And, and they are, you know, amazing PR people. So they really brought those things to, to uh, unprecedented levels of popularity. Better tools. So in 2001, the, you know, the programming tools and the, it all really sucked. It was horrible. And now we have like Scratch. We have, you know, a lot of very easy to use tools, so that makes a big difference. And finally, you know, better research. So we have a lot of people doing research in this field, so that's easier. It's easier to talk to policymakers, to principals, and all of that. So all of this happened, and then, you know, it became what we call the maker movement, or, you know, it uh, resulted in, in a lot of this. Of course, part of this is you know, the Maker Fair and, and the Make Magazine and, and the, all of those things, the Fab Lab movement uh, also. But, you know, people have been a bit uneasy about the Maker movement in education. And, you know, if you know, for example, Leah Bickley, a very outspoken uh, critic of what's happening with the Maker movement, especially around diversity and equity. So what are the problems that, you know, we are facing now about spreading the maker movement in education. So I'll talk about three main things that I think are, are uh, important things. So the first one is this issue of uh, uh, equity and access. So, you know, you might have seen this before. This is the, the, the kind of materials that the make, Maker Fair sends to sponsors, talking about the kind of people that come to the Maker Fair. So, you know, it's kind of self-explanatory that 80% have a post postgraduate education and uh, you know the median household income is $106,000 and all of that. So people that are that have access to those kinds of things that, that's not the, the average American uh, family, right? So that's one one big issue. Also Leah Bickley, you know, did this, this very famous talk where she she actually did all the stats and she showed that out of all the covers of the Make magazine 85% of the people shown on the cover are white boys, right? And uh, so you can go online and see all of that. So uh, I think, you know, this is one, one of the issues we have to talk about. And, and the and thing is that it doesn't happen by itself. So spontaneously, people with resources and money, they, you know, take their kids to the Maker Fair. They, they put their kids in schools that have labs and all of that. So this requires, uh, you know, work. It doesn't really uh, happen by itself. So 
the other thing about this is that this is not any more a technical problem. It's not that you know I can write a paper and 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 get uh, uh, you know convince people. It, this is a, a, a political problem because you have to talk to districts and get more money and all of that. So it, it's that kind of problem now. The second problem that I think we have to face is that you know I've been saying that children are not hackers. So this idea that uh, we can just put kids in a lab and you know they will learn things by themselves they don't need anyone helping because kids are all smart and hackers that's just not true I mean you know a few kids will do that but a lot of them will not and we've seen in our research that a lot of times if you don't provide facilitation if you don't provide teachers to help them they come out of the lab uh, more discouraged and less kind of uh, uh, STEM inclined than they when they came in because they you, you reinforce the stereotype that they have that they, they can't do science they can't do engineering and all of that the third issue I think is this idea that you know it's there's this discourse that's really kind of uh, annoying to me that's oh this is about the STEM careers and their jobs in computer science you know it reminds me of the the graduate the movie where the guy said oh you know there is a big future in plastics you know if you, you might know that movie that the graduate asks like I think his uh, you know an older person say oh wh which major should I then say oh plastics that's the big thing and and I think this discourse is you know it objectifies kids it's make it, it makes it look like kids are like human resources in a pipeline and we need to produce more of this type but you know what if hypothetically we run out of jobs in computer science in five years so then we're gonna get rid of coding in the schools or making doesn't matter anymore because now we don't need engineers or so I like to think that it, it should be much more about exposing kids to powerful ideas to expressive media it should be about making them you know well-rounded individuals rather than preparing them for jobs because we don't prepare we don't teach music in schools because there are so many jobs for violin violinists um, we, we teach them because music is an important thing to know, to learn. You appreciate the word better with music and, and all of that. So I know I, I might be completely out of time. So um, um, I just want to, uh, you know, f finish with uh, one, uh, w one thought. And... Um, so I think our, our focus in the maker movement has to change from, um, uh, you know, this kind of excitement about something that's new and cool and all of that to being a bit more systematic and a bit more intentional about what kinds of things we want to accomplish with, with this movement. And, and to turn, you know, the excitement into a really democratizing uh, movement. Uh, because spontaneously that democratization is not just not going to happen as we, as we know. And, uh, you know, but I think that requires uh, going against the grain because uh, it requires, you know, this terrible thing. It requires money because we need to hire more people to do this. We, we need to buy stuff. We need to renovate spaces. Uh, it requires a lot of work. It's not something that you just flip a switch and the world becomes a maker heaven. You know, it requires uh, uh, long-term engagement with teachers, with schools, and that's a lot of work that that's not in the Silicon Valley kind of ethos of instantaneous change with no effort uh, kind of thing. Uh, and it, change, it, it also challenges established practices. So, you know, it, it goes against the grain. It's hard work. It's, it's difficult. But, you know, and, and I think w a lot of times when I say those things, and you might have heard this, and, and this is really the end, uh, you, you might... <laughs> You, you might hear things like, but, you know, can't we settle for less? I mean, this is so hard. It's so expensive. Can't we, can't we just do less? Maybe we do like a truck that can go to many schools and do a little bit of making, you know, but we don't really have money for like a lab or, or a teacher to do this and all of that. You know, and, and isn't this better than nothing? And, and I think, um, you know, the, the, the essence of, of inequity in education is when uh, we hear this question, isn't this better than nothing? And we say yes to that. Because that's what generates the, the, the huge difference that we, we see and that's also what makes us stop uh, fighting for every kid to have the same right for making, for education and for everything else. Thank you.
conversation. Again, if you have a particular question you want to make sure we get to either now or later or something like that, um, that um, web page we put up there is EDF Equity 7. And uh, you can put a question up there. We've heard some really important ideas. And um, I think actually kind of I'd like to start by coming, by really by coming to this question that, that Paula raised, which is if you do a little bit, is that enough? If you do a little bit, is that enough? Or a way someone phrased it from the audience is, uh, are there things that we should give up in order to do making? Hello. And um, so I'd, I'd love to, to have you all kind of weigh in. First, there does seem to be this, I'm going to kind of put in my own two cents here. I think there is a myth that says that we have to stop doing something if we are going to do making. Agreed. Is that a myth? Is that the truth? Do we have to stop teaching language arts? Do we have to stop teaching math? That's a myth. That's I, a myth. That's tell a, us why. A great question that a, a, a friend of mine asked earlier was how do we do this in practice? And the thing that, that I think that we had to realize was that, is that we had to not think of it as something we do in addition to, but really think about why we do it and a purpose. You know, for example, we use Minecraft in writing. How do we use it? Well, Lego sells this great kit called, um, it's like Lego Story Creator. And we found that in Minecraft, we could have kits build as much detail as possible and then use that to stimulate writing. Um, or, or even um, doing um, the kind of the structured writing on explaining how something works that they created through like um, redstone, some piece of circuitry, that we could use that in, in certain ways. But it's a mindset issue. It's, it's not something you do as an extra, you shouldn't have maker day. You shouldn't have, just like you shouldn't have lab day, um, you should think about building and creating as something that is a normal part of the way we learn. Right. Yeah. And to add to that, <clears throat> I think we are being challenged to extend beyond the walls of school. So, you know, you know, in Chicago we have three, some of the libraries now have 3D printers. So why can't a student do something at school and then extend it into the home and print it out at the library, or how do you start something starts in out of school space and brings it back in? So for us, well, we're not approaching it as let's have our teachers do it right away. Chicago has a whole other set of issues around asking teachers to do things given where our budget issues are. <laughs> but we are trying to figure out how to connect the libraries to parks and to create an um, ecosystem, if you will, where kids can be, where they can connect all these learning opportunities. But the challenge is we have to get them to come back into the school. So it doesn't work if they're doing all this stuff and the school never knows about it. You have to figure out a way in which it's visible and understandable to teachers so they can connect to it. Great, yeah. Um, I, I also agree this is a great question. I write grants and go into school districts to uh, do projects and most of the districts I go into don't have an art time. So any project I do is STEAM and it will tie directly into their math standards or their science standards or the language arts. And now with Common Core, you need that explanatory writing for your project. You need to synthesize the different disciplines. And so you can really use making as a way to hit those targets um, that you, know, you need to address with Common Core. In the summer, I run a six-week summer camp. Um, and we have a little more latitude, but some of that kind of maker approach can help sustain them um, with the actual core learning that they're trying to maintain. Because uh, they fall behind during the summer, but to keep them kind of on par when they're entering school again. So I think making is really yeah, and Paula? I, I think there are ways to, uh, I mean, find opportunities within the curriculum to, to introduce making, but that requires a lot of dialogue between teachers and the maker teacher or the maker people in the school, right? Uh, so, for example, in one school uh, we work with, the, the teacher said, oh, I, ha I want kids to memorize all the capitals of whatever, so I want you to do a maker activity to and I said, well, maybe that's not the best. Like, uh, <laughs> so, uh, but you know, in, in many other cases, there are very interesting uh, kind of uh, opportunities to introduce making that uh, teachers found in when they kind of went to the lab and got to got familiar with the machines, and 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 we, you know, were fortunate in some schools to get the principal to agree to pay some hours. Uh, 
for the teacher and the maker uh, lab person to sit together and go through the curriculum and, and, and the lesson plans and say, okay, we'll transform this lesson plan into a maker lesson plan. So, the, um, the wonderful thing you said is that idea of, oh, let's use a making project to learn the 50 states and the capitals. Um, a long time ago, a long, long time ago, um, when my father, who was born in 1926, was a child, he had a best friend, and his friend got into Stanford University because at the age of 10, he knew all the capitals of all the existing states. What a crazy way to get into Stanford, right? I mean, that wouldn't happen today. And so really what you're all saying is that school is changing, right? Okay. School is changing. Nicole, when you talk about sort of expanding those boundaries of going into the home, I mean, how many people here think of their work as stopping at 5 o'clock? Anybody's work stopped at 5 o'clock recently? Right. Oh, you. Uh, really? Congratulations. <laughs> You're a little bit alone in this crowd. Um, talk about how our idea of learning and schools is kind of going outside of those boundaries and is making really about changing our idea of what we're trying to, you know, that, that what we're trying to teach kids, what we're trying, what we want them to walk away from their educational experience. I think we've had, <clears throat> there's two different definitions of learning. There's learning that takes place outside of school. You learn sports, you learn all kinds of things. Cook, you learn to do all kinds of things. And you look at how kids learn Minecraft. I mean, Minecraft is not something you learn by, you have to learn how to find resources, how to search, seek. No one sits down to Minecraft and figures it out without using some form of resources. At least I can. Um, so learning takes place that way. But in school, and it's failure driven. And in school, it's right answer. Okay, I don't want to be vulnerable. I don't want to fail. I don't want to, I don't even ask. I don't even know what you're doing. I mean, if I ask somebody sitting next to me what they're doing, in many schools, not all schools, that's the wrong way. So in some sense, what we're trying to do is sort of create one definition join the definition of learning and take the failure-driven learning approach and extend it back into the school day. But part of that, I think, entails giving resources to teachers, partners to teachers, to help them do these types of things. I just don't think it's fair to say to a teacher, you now have to be the maker, you have to be the coding teacher, the making teacher, still do the math, still do the science, and also provide all the social supports. So I think it's really figuring out how you know, the same way in coding we think about how modules connect together. <clears throat> how do we think about all the ecosystems, all the places in our community that are part of our ecosystem, how they contribute together and push information in and also pull information out so that kids are learning anytime, anywhere, where they are. Well, Franz, I love that, that meme of your teachers going, ah, I have to learn this too. Talk a little bit about what you learned about getting teachers through this, about changing their idea of their role of learning itself. Yeah, you know what, the, the reality is a lot of pressure from the outside now that we're, we are trying to change education in a system that is not changing with where we want it to go, let's be real. Um, we can say that education is changing all day, but at the end of the day, when you're on the ground level in schools, it's not changing as fast as we would like for it to, to, to be. And so probably the biggest lesson I learned was that. You know, I've, I'm coming in with all of these big ideas that no one in my little small disconnected town have heard about. Um, but I'm also fighting against um, a monthly assessment by our district that are done by an executive director of curriculum, um, accountability that we have to give to the state, and a series of, of uh, mandates that the teachers have. And then we want to tag on, well, now we want you to do it all different but we haven't really talked about how that looks and sometimes it's not the teacher's choice. We had to change the mindset from the top and what our expectations were at the top and we're not all the way there yet. Um, we still have a bit more work to do but we also know that and are working towards doing it and I think that people have to remember that. It's not always the teacher that isn't doing it, it's, it's the teacher working against the system that doesn't yet allow it. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to tag on that because I completely agree. I go into many districts and especially in the underserved districts, you have a high cycle out of superintendents, of principals and teachers. And when the administration leaves, um, the next administrator who comes in does not want to advocate for something that has started already. And so I really feel like 
to sustain makerspace innovation, these safe places for making, we have to leverage the informal learning spaces and the libraries in these communities and the museums and the, and the bigger, larger ecosystem. But like you were saying, just really leverage the ecosystem because underserved students are underserved in more ways than one. And part of that's consistency of um, administration and staff. Mm -hmm. Can I ask yeah. you? Also what happens is when you extend to these places, you often also realize we need a lot more professional development even in these places. Um, what does it mean? I mean, librarians, many libraries are just now getting used librarians. So you go into some libraries and say, start doing maker stuff. They're not equipped to do that. I mean, how many programs actually have youth development? If you want someone, if someone wants a career in working with youth where they're not a teacher, a formal school mm -hmm. teacher, but they're going to work in out of school spaces, there really aren't career ladders for that. So I think we have to begin to start thinking about what's that infrastructure, the professional, I mean, extending our definition of teachers formal and informal and creating the career ladders that allow people who want to stay in that space to actually have careers and jobs without having to, you know, work at four different places at, at one time. But not just teachers. I've seen the, several of those spaces set up for teachers to come into. If we always mm -hmm. invite the teachers in, which we should, but we also need to make a concerted effort to get administrators in too and not mm -hmm. just have them look at it and see a presentation, but have them actually make and create something. I mean, if I, I like to tie it to, if you needed to fix something in your house right now, how would you do it? And nine times out of 10, they say YouTube, and they'll go on YouTube and they'll learn how to do something. Mm -hmm. That's what this entire, it's not just the, the idea of going, I like how you said it's not about just going into a STEM career. It is that ability to know that you can fix or do something or create something just because you want to or just because you need to. And how do we, how do we give the students the skills to do that if we don't understand the realities of the necessity of learning it. Is there a difference between making and tinkering, or does it matter? I think so. They're all just words. It doesn't matter just at this words. point. OK. Paulo? Well, I mean, I think uh, related to that question is uh, a bigger question about what is making, right? And uh, in, uh, some, some meetings I went to, people said, oh, making is Making can be anything, like cooking is making, cutting a piece of paper with scissors is making, and all of that. And, and you know, as much as I think we should be inclusive, I think there should be l limits, too. Because why? If, why, 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 why? What are the limits you want to put on making? Well, I think if something is, can be anything, it becomes nothing, right? So but is making about the physical act, or is it about the mindset and the sort of investigative, creative nature of it? Well, you know, I, I think it's a, it becomes a very complicated thing. For example, art. Art is, is art making. I mean, art is a field that has its own established rules and practices and materials and all of that. And I think when we say, oh, art is making, anyone can do art even without studying anything or whatever, just anything can be any, I think it becomes a bit um, kind of uh, too, um, too diffuse. Too diffuse mm -hmm. in a way that we don't have way, because I think one of the important things about making or any kind of thing is it, you need to have a community that knows how to judge quality, right? So if, you ha if you're doing something, you want people to become better at something. Mm -hmm. So you need to have the, the, the knowledge and the practices to judge if people are becoming better at something. Otherwise, Otherwise it's hard know. to know. Yeah, and yeah. Like, say that in our um, summer camp, I have a six-week summer camp that's all day, we divide the day into two halves. One is focus learning time, and one is the other half is tinker time after lunch. Um, and kids are very um, possessive of the tinker time. We used to bring in guest speakers during that time, but that is their time to explore whatever they want. In the morning, the design journey, the maker time, is for something that has criteria and constraints that are applied to that journey, and as you were saying, requires um, some sort of skill development. Um, you can do that in tinkering as well, but that's more free time, more kind of journey in your head exploration. And I think um, it's advantageous to have both because then they can really separate in their heads as well and see the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with what you're saying. Yeah, Nicole. <coughs> Excuse me. Where does in making, um, I'm curious for both all of you, design aesthetics come into play? Because at least I've seen with the girls. When it's just let me make, like follow something on Instructables, it's like I did it, follow instruction is there. But when it's, you know, you're talking about colors, for someone, it's an audience, there's a different level of engagement 
and oh, this is wrong. I want to take it apart and do it again. And at least I've seen when we when we've added the design or something you're going to wear, then it 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 um, increases the engagement, but also the sense of this is for someone. And I found, and we've seen this a lot. Of people talk about this in coding and. Girls don't just want to learn to code for the sake of coding. It's, I'm solving a problem and producing something. So I do think there's something around design aesthetics, meeting, making, particularly in the middle grades. It'd be interesting to see where it goes after that, that it can sort of keep them locked in to developing the skill sets that are needed. And I'm curious, have you seen it, or is, it, is that just something I'm witnessing in Chicago, or what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, just quick. Uh, I think definitely, uh, so one of my students, uh, Richard Davis, he did uh, work on uh, with uh, a Latina uh, uh, girls, and she realized that they were much more motivated when they were creating something for a family member than from them for themselves. Mm -hmm. While when we work with uh, like white boys from Palo Alto, they wanted to do stuff for themselves because that's what they. Mm -hmm. So I think definitely there is something about when you create, especially for some. Uh, different kind of uh, groups and gender and all that, when you're creating for other people, uh, there are a, a new set of concerns that you start uh, caring about mm -hmm. and that make the projects a lot more interesting. So we're going to run out of time, which is um, a very sad thing, but I do think everyone will stick around. And if you have additional questions, we'll certainly share these with the speakers. But um, so many of you made the point that uh, showing an example is a great way to start the people, everyone, educators, parents, need to have examples. And so I'd like to ask you as kind of a, uh, a final wrap-up question, if you could share one piece of advice, one piece of practical advice to teachers, to educators, to administrators and parents who want to see something happen in their communities, who want to do what you've described, reach kids where they are and make sure in your lovely words, that these things are sticky, that they're inclusive, that, that we're bringing in all of the kids, that, w that everyone has a key to the room. What, is there a piece of advice that you can share, a starting point that you can share with folks? I think I wouldn't even start from a single point. I don't know if you were asking me to go, go first, ahead. but I just Absolutely. asked the Thank question. Um, I think about um, Jamie Castle from Google often says um, when he, when we're look, thinking about doing this work, if we need to think about what problems the kids want to solve, and we need to ask them that. And I think about our own student. His name is Daniel. And he's headed to MIT in the fall, but he um, wears a hearing aid and can only wake up in the morning because his dad whistles to him. He can't hear an alarm clock. So using a Makey Makey, part of his, one of his projects he had to do leading up to MIT was he designed an alarm clock that plays a whistle sound so that he could hear it. Um, but he, you know, as an exceptional student, they figured out the code and how to make this thing because he wanted to. But the deal was he made something because he needed it, and he needed it, so he figured out how to make it. Um, so we definitely need to ask kids what um, problems they want to solve, but we also need to make sure we have an eye on have we created the space for them to do it? And if we haven't created the space for them to do it and provided the tools and pathways to do it, what can we do to change that? And I think for us in schools, that's where it starts. So to, <clears throat> to piggyback on that, I think there's two pieces. One is it is about places and spaces. So when we started U Media in Chicago, we were amazed that we didn't realize that these places didn't exist. We didn't think we were creating a new type of place. We're like, okay, it's a place where kids can come and do things. And then in talking to the kids, they're like, we have no other place where high schoolers can go and just be without having to purchase something, without having to be in a structured program, where we can just go and sort of chill, relax, and have access to resources. So one is just creating spaces. But then the other important thing is showcasing. You don't know what you want to be unless you see it. And you also, oftentimes we only see experts. So you need to be able to see that person right next to you. You need to see, oh, that kid did that. Oh, I can do that. And little by little, if you're constantly seeing, you get a little better. The next person gets it better, and you look up, and then you've moved. The whole community has moved a step. So spaces, but also showcases where you can actually see what each other is doing. Great. Yeah. I, I think one, one thing I would recommend is to uh, focus on, on the people and not on the technology. So if you are if you want to do this in your school, uh, fight 
to hire a, a maker teacher or a person who will run this program more than for like a half million dollar lab uh, that will go empty. You know? mm -hmm. So I, I think a lot of people, people start buying a lot of stuff and then say, oh yeah, we'll figure it out later. And so I would recommend always hiring a, a person to run the program, the right person first, and then you can slowly you know, buy the stuff that will make the thing uh, grow. Um, I guess my advice would be to do it. And as you do create your space and what you're doing, be open about your own learning and that have feedback from the students. And I find um, you have to create a community. Um, what I've had lessons or journeys that are completely failing. And if I'm open with the students, like, oh my gosh, this is so not working. Hold your thoughts, give me feedback, and you will help design it for the next class that comes in. You get buy-in for the next project you introduce. Otherwise, you just don't have buy-in. So I think being very open about, I'm a learner too, we're, we're creating this, who knows where it's going to go, that totally failed. <laughs> uh, where do we go from here? Being able to pivot and be open that you're going to pivot in different directions. Mm -hmm. So be open. Actually make things, help people make things, create the space so that people can make those things. Remember that equity doesn't happen by accident. It won't just happen if you don't do something about it, if you're not aware, if you're not asking the questions, if you're not listening. And uh, that, the, um, that uh, the equitable spaces also require a broader ecosystem, the parents, families, friends, the community, so that we can showcase things and so that we can be inspired. Please join me in thanking these people who inspire us all.